What you see on the table are slide rules that had particular scales or other adaptations for the electrical engineer. That is, often the, they were regular slide rules, perhaps on one side, and then on the other side they had a set of special scales. Back when I uh, started on this uh, slide rule diversion, <laughs> The, I pointed out that there were some specialty rules for chemistry, engineering, and electronics. And by engineering, I meant including civil and mechanical engineering and so on. And you've seen some of those throughout the, uh, the list of individual manufacturer's rules. Here are the ones that are particularly aimed at engineers. And I've separated them. On the left, over here, are three rules that have special scales for computing things like capacitive and inductive reactants, resonant frequency, and things of that sort. On the other side, the right side, are five rules that are what might be called vector rules or rules that contain hyperbolic functions. Now there's one rule missing from this that I eliminated, which is the model four. Uh, the the N4. Uh, the, this is the Model 4T from Pickett. The N4 has exactly the same scales with regard to hyperbolic as this one, so I decided not to, to just add one for the sake of adding it. But these, coming back over here, these two rules, the one at the top is a special Pickett rule that was made for the Capital Radio Engineering Institute. It has uh, a scale on it for called 2 pi that is for calculating reactants and so on. The one below it was uh, a rule that Pickett did for the uh, Cleveland Institute of Electronics. And then the one at the bottom is the HEMI 266, which is, has got an awful lot of specialty scales on, the, on this side. So before I talk about these five rules, I'm going to talk a little bit about these three and, and some of the literature that you can get for these three. The first that I want to talk about is an article in the Journal of the Outred Society called Five Picket Electronic Slide Rules. And it discusses in a little bit of detail the these two, the top two. That appeared in the journal in uh, volume 11, number 2, the fall of 2002. And you can find that on the International Slide Rule Museum's website. I think there's a link to the Outred Society that at any rate this, uh, if I remember right, this, this uh, article uh, can be found there. The, a second source is a set of lessons that were published by the Cleveland Institute of Electronics. And the I uh, uh, have part three and part four here. You can find these at the RF Cafe. And then finally, there is a set of instructions that you can find on the uh, International Slide Rule Museum's website that has the instructions for the 266 that talk about the scales here. So what do these rules do? Well, if we... I'm going to slide this one over a little bit so that we can zoom in a little. And what you can see is the scales allow you to do things like resonant frequency, inductive capacitive reactance, etc. The, the rule that was done for the Capital Radio Engineering Institute, the one above it, also can do the same thing. It has a scale it's on the other side, that you see here called 2 pi. 
And what that enables you to do is to compute things like inductive and capacitive reactants, which inductive reactants, of course, is 2 pi FL, and uh, capacitive reactants is 1 over 2 pi FC. So you can calculate all of those using this 2 pi scale. The the Cleveland Institute rule has that rule, that scale plus some additional scales. I'm not going to go into too many of the details of those. If, if somebody wants to see those demonstrated, I will. But I, I suggest that you'll probably learn more and become more proficient if you just simply download those manuals I've talked about. Whether you have the rule in front of you or not, you can still use them to advantage in learning the... Uh, The, the way that they operate. Below is what I consider to be the epitome of electronic slide rules. This is the Hemi 266. And once again, I suggest if you want to learn the exact details of these scales, go ahead and download the manual from the International Slide Rule Museum. If you're lucky enough to be able to find a 266 and by that I mean if you're if you're rich you can just buy one but if you're not so rich you'll have to be a little bit lucky because they don't come on the market very often and when they do they're often bid up to into the, into the several hundred dollar category not exactly something that someone would want to pay for and just have as a toy or something that they looked at a couple of times so at any rate, those are the slide rules that do electronics. Now, in many cases, people consider these to be electronic technician kinds of calculations because they're, they are not uh, the more complicated vector calculations that you'll see in the next section. But nonetheless, many Many practicing engineers and many engineering students have used these rules over the years, and they were a very helpful addition to the learning and the practice of uh, electrical engineering. These now are the vector slide rules. That is, they were often called vector log log, or sometimes they were referred to as the, hyper, the hyperbolic function slide rules because... Uh, basically, they had scales on them that enable you to calculate hyperbolic functions. Now, what I'm going to do is just give you a, just a brief idea of these slide rules, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of information about hyperbolic functions. And I'm doing it in that order so that those of you who don't want to continue watching what is, I will admit, not only advanced but also pretty dry mathematics you may want to uh, to stop, and I don't want you to have to fast forward through to find the, the the basic stuff. So right now, let's just talk about the basic stuff. And for that, I'm going to use this bottom rule, which is the uh, Dietzen uh, Microglide 17 N1725 vector log log. The one above it is also a Dietzen. It's the uh, 1735. It's an older rule. The one above that is a Sun Hemi 153, and you may remember this is the one that has the Gutermannian scale. And as I pointed out, Professor Herning has uh, three good videos on this particular rule, including the use of the Gutermannian to compute hyperbolic sines and cosines and so on. So once again, I'm not going to talk about that one. The one above that is made by uh, Keffel and Esser, and that is the 4083-3, which is also a vector log log, and I've already pointed to the, uh, the picket. Both the Model 4 and the N4 have hyperbolic uh, scales. So let's take a look at those scales, and then let's get on with uh, an overview of hyperbolic functions. This is a close-up of the left-hand end of the Dietzen N1725 vector log-log slide rule. At the top, you will see 
three scales that are used for hyperbolic functions, or what they call vector functions. The top one is the TH scale, which is for hyperbolic tangents, and the two below it are uh, a double scale for hyperbolic sines. By double scale, I mean that it runs twice as long as the rule itself, and so of course it's cut in the middle, and one scale is placed under SH1 and the other one is placed uh, as SH2. These are used to look up hyperbolic sines and cosines as well as hyperbolic tangents. From those you can compute the other hyperbolic functions like the hyperbolic cosine, the hyperbolic secant, etc. So at this point, I'm going to stop looking at the slide rule itself, and I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of what hyperbolic functions are and why they were important and still are in electrical engineering. Here is a page from Frederick Terman's Electronic and Radio Engineering, later uh, called uh, Electronic Television and Radio Engineering in subsequent editions, that talks about the matching of a transmission line and the calculations necessary to determine how the uh, transmission line uh, is affected by, in this case, a T-network that is put together. Now, the same problems arise in the calculation of losses in transmission lines and even in civil engineering uh, cases where you hang a weighted cable, you will find that if you hang a weighted cable between two points, you do not get a, a circle. What you get is actually a hyperbolic function. And so hyperbolic sine, cosine, tangent were invented for the purpose originally of modeling those sorts of things. Later in transmission lines they were found to be uh, equally useful. So here for example are some of the calculations that you need to be able to do for these are, this is for a T section, this is for a pi section, and you may notice that here you have cosh, C-O-S-H, which is the hyperbolic cosine of a, of a function, and here is the hyperbolic cosine of a different, slightly different function. In this case, this is for a symmetrical pi section, this is for a symmetrical T section but they bo both need the calculation of the hyperbolic cosine. So uh, let's take a quick look at what a hyperbolic function is. The basis of this figure is taken from the this Dietzen slide rule manual, the 1725 vector log log slide rule manual. This is figure 59 from that manual and I recommend that if you really want to learn hyperbolic functions. This is probably as good a way to learn it, as good a text on hyperbolic functions as you'll find. It also contains specific uh, instructions on how to use a vector log log slide rule to calculate some of these things. So why are they called hyperbolic functions? Well, unlike regular trig functions, which are based on a circle, the hyperbolic functions are based on a hyperbola. And you, if you have studied hyperbolas in algebra or calculus, you know that the formula is x squared minus y squared equals a squared. The formula for a circle is x squared plus y squared equals a squared, where a is the radius. This is a graph of what the hyperbolic cosine looks like, this curve, what the hyperbolic sine looks like, this curve, kind of an S curve, and what the hyperbolic tangent looks like, which is this curve. 
Notice that the tangent approaches an asymptote on both sides. The, the hyperbolic sine and cosine are, can increase without limit, whereas the hyperbolic tangent uh, is limited in what it can do. And then contrast this with the trig functions in which it's the tangent that tends to blow up as the angle gets big. But at any rate, if you keep this in mind when you're trying to calculate hyperbolic sine, cosine, and tangent, on a slide rule like the ones we looked at, so looking at the right-hand end, you notice that these are labeled, the hyperbolic tangent is labeled 1x, hyperbolic sine, the, the lower scale, which is the hyperbolic sine 1, is labeled 1x also, but the hyperbolic sine 2 is labeled 10x. And if you want to go further, you'd have to have a hyperbolic sine 3, which would be 100x, and so on. I apologize if this seems a little too hand-wavy. At one point, I had actually intended to go into an example, and then I realized that in the first place, slide rules are out of date. There's nobody who's going to use a slide rule to do these computations anymore. And second, even if you want to understand hyperbolic functions, there's a lot of math that you need to understand first. And some good uh, videos on YouTube about that, but certainly not something that I could put in any kind of video that would last less than several hours. So I hope you'll, I will, can apologize and you will accept my apology for being a little hand wavy here. But what I'm trying to do is to point out the areas where I have seen students and engineers go wrong in the past in not understanding that we're not talking about trig here, we're talking about an entirely new set of mathematics. So, if you've lasted this long, congratulations. <laughs> I apologize for, for this boring latter part. I don't know, maybe you found it interesting. I always did. But I'm sure that we've lost most of the, of the audience by now. So, this will probably be the last uh, video I do on slide rules. And, uh, but I do look forward to doing some other things. Maybe someday I'll be able to get back to the lab manual for the art of electronics. But in the meantime, have a nice day.